Our featured guest speaker today is Greta Christina. Greta Christina is the author of Why Are You Atheists So Angry, Com Coming Out Atheist, and the just released Comforting Thoughts About Death That Have Nothing to Do With God. She is also a regular contributor for Salon Alternate and Alternate, Free Inquiry Magazine, and Humanist Magazine, uh, as well as a featured blogger at Free Thought Blogs with one of those popular atheist blogs on the internet, which is called Greta's blog, or Greta Christina's <laughs> blog. <laughs> So, uh, she has also appeared in numerous magazines, newspapers, and anthologies, including Miss Magazine, Skeptical Inquirer Magazine, uh, the Chicago Sun-Times, and the anthology, Everything You Know About God is Wrong. Uh, and she's written on topics including sexuality, sex positivity, LGBT issues, and politics, culture, and of course, atheism. And her presentation today will tie into her latest book, and her presentation will be called Atheist Philosophies on of Death. So please warmly welcome our guest speaker today, Greta Christina. Thank you so much. Uh, huge thanks to Vic for uh, organizing this and to the Humanists of Houston uh, board members and organizers for making this happen. Also to the uh, uh, Houston Atheists and the Black Nonbelievers and everybody who helped get the word out about this. And also just thanks to all of you for coming out here tonight. Um, and I especially want to thank you for inviting me here today and coming out here today uh, to hear me give this particular talk, uh, my talk on atheist philosophies of death. Um, I think this is a hugely important topic, um, and I think it's one that we need to spend a lot more time talking about. Um, I would like to see us talk more about death and mortality, um, not just within the atheist and humanist community, uh, but outside in the larger world. Um, for many atheists and humanists, accepting the permanence of death is one of the hardest things uh, about letting go of religion, and for many religious believers, their fear of death is one of the biggest obstacles uh, to letting go of religion or even questioning religion. Um, and, and this was certainly true for me. When I was letting go of my own spiritual beliefs and was accepting the fact that I really was mortal, you know, the fact that I really was going to die, and that the people I loved were really going to die, and that these deaths really would be final, this, by far, was the part about becoming an atheist that was most upsetting. Um, and I went through this process essentially alone. You know, the so-called new atheist movement, air quotes, new atheist movement, um, it was just getting off the ground at that time, and I didn't know that it even existed, you know, and much less what kinds of worldviews it, it had to offer about life and about death. And so I had to reinvent the wheel. You know, I, I had to come up with my own godless, afterlifeless philosophies of death, more or less by myself. And that sucked. That was a really difficult, really hard time in my life, and, and I don't want anybody else to have to go through that alone. You know, if we can provide other non-believers and proto-non-believers, I guess we could call it, um, other people who might become non-believers, with some kind of math to help guide them through this dark night of the soul, or I guess the dark night of the soulless. Um, I, I think that we should do that. You know, if we have compassion for people who are struggling with their religious beliefs, uh, and if we have compassion for people who have let go of religion but are struggling to find peace with their non-belief, um, I think we need to do more than just show them that atheism is accurate. I think we need to do more than just, you know, here's all the reasons God doesn't exist. I mean, I love talking about all the reasons God doesn't exist. But I think we need to do more than just showing them that atheism is right. I think we need to show people that atheism is okay. You know, we need to show people that atheists have meaning and, and comfort and joy in our lives. Um, and we need to show that we're able to face death. You know, the death of those we love and our own eventual death. You know, without just abject terror and despair. Um, you know, we need to make it clear that when people let go of religion, they're not going to just fall into a bleak, meaningless, depressing void forever. Um, you know, we need to make it clear that atheism is a safe place to land. Um, and so today, I want to talk about atheist philosophies of death. 
Um, I'm not going to talk very much about flaws in religious philosophies of death. Um, I do think that that is a fascinating and very fruitful and interesting topic. Um, and in its own way, uh, that topic can offer some comfort and solace for non-believers. And so I'm going to touch on it a little bit. Um, but I do have limited time today. And so for the most part, uh, rather than focusing on why religious views of death are mistaken or, or inconsistent, uh, I mostly want to focus on what atheism can offer in its place. Um, but before that, um, I want to spend just a little time defending the very idea of atheist philosophies of death that provide comfort and meaning. Now, it surprises me a little bit that I should have to do this. When I first started writing and speaking about atheist views of death, it didn't occur to me that I should have to explain to atheists why this was an okay thing to do. Um, but experience has taught me that I do. Um, I found that when I write and speak about atheist views of death that can give comfort and solace, I often get very vigorous pushback. Not from believers, I mean sometimes from believers, but from other atheists. Um, now sometimes these atheists will complain that the particular philosophy of death that I'm talking about isn't very comforting, that they don't find it comforting, therefore it just objectively isn't to anybody. Um, and sometimes they object to the whole exercise. Uh, they, they will argue that atheism cannot possibly present views of death that could compete with religious views, with the comfort offered by religion in the face of death. Uh, they'll argue that it's deceptive or deluded uh, to even pretend that this is possible, and they think we shouldn't even try. And so before I get into some of these specific philosophies of death, um, I want to respond to that. Um, and I think part of the problem here may lie with the word comfort and with some people's expectations of it. Um, so I want to spell out what exactly I mean by that. Uh, when I say that some particular view of death offers comfort, I don't mean that it completely eradicates any pain or fear or grief associated with death. I mean, of course it doesn't do that. Nothing does that. Not even religion does that. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more in a bit. So when I say, you know, that this particular view of death offers comfort, I'm not saying, well, if you view death this way, death will absolutely no longer trouble you. You know, you will be able to view death just totally blithely, totally cheerfully, la la la, everybody's going to die and that's fine with me. You know, the death of the people you love and your own eventual death, that's not going to be a problem even a little bit. That is not what I mean <laughs> by comfort. Um, so here's what I do mean. When I say that a particular atheist philosophy of death offers comfort, what I mean is that it can, to some extent, alleviate the suffering and grief uh, caused by death. Um, it, it can make that suffering and grief uh, less overwhelming, uh, less unbearable. You know, it doesn't make the pain disappear, but it can put that pain um, in, into a context that gives it some sort of meaning. Um, and, and it can offer us the hope that with time, uh, that pain will diminish. Uh, you know, it, it can give us a sense that, that there's a bridge over the chasm, you know, a feeling of trust that when the worst of that grief or fear passes, we'll have a solid foundation to return to, we'll have a life to return to that, we will, that, that will give us meaning. Um, uh, when I say that an atheist philosophy offers comfort, one of the things I mean is that it can help us make better decisions about death and about life. Um, you know, decisions that are calmer, that are less reactive, less driven by fear, you know, decisions that are more in keeping with our real deepest held values. Um, it doesn't make the grief and fear go away, it just makes it better. And, and that's what I mean by comfort. You know, it, it would be nice if atheist philosophies of death could do more than that. I mean, but, you know, Death is frightening, death is upsetting. I don't think there's any way around that. Um, the fact that atheism can even provide this degree of comfort, this degree of alleviation of how upsetting death is, um, I think that's not trivial. And very importantly, um, religion doesn't do any better. You know, it's, it's ever since I became an, an atheist, I've been really struck by the fact that even when people believe that death is no more than a temporary separation, they still 
grieve. They grieve deeply and desperately when the people they love die. They act as if they were never going to see these people again, even if they believe or say they believe that they're going to see them again later. Um, belief in an afterlife, it doesn't stop death from being upsetting. It doesn't keep people from mourning and terrible anguish when their loved ones die. It doesn't keep people from missing the people in their life who have died for years for the rest of their lives. And it doesn't keep people from fearing their own death and from putting off their own deaths as long as they can. You know, the comfort of religion doesn't eradicate grief any more than the comfort of atheism does. It, it just alleviates it to some extent. Uh, and, and in fact, many people who believe in an afterlife aren't actually very comforted by that belief. You know, it's very common for believers to actually be tormented by the thought that, first of all, by the fear that they might themselves not be going to heaven, that they might themselves be going to hell. Um, it's common for them to be tormented by the thought that even if they're going to heaven, the people that they love, their friends and family who aren't going to heaven, they're going to be tortured forever in hell. And, and how could heaven possibly be heaven if their loved ones are burning in hell? I mean, there's many religious beliefs about death that, that don't fill their believers with comfort, that actually fill them with terror and guilt. And many atheists who once held these beliefs um, say that actually letting go of them was a profound relief. In fact, I want to do a little show of hands. Is there anybody here who was, was a religious believer, who's now an atheist, and who's all like, yeah, I way rather think that there's no afterlife than believe in the afterlife that my religion taught me. I mean, look around, keep your hands up and look around. That's not a trivial number. You know, there's a lot of people who would just much rather believe in no afterlife at all than that this afterlife that's determined by this capricious, nitpicky, vengeful, brutal God that they were brought up to believe in. Um, and then there's the question of how comforting can a belief really be when you have to be in a constant state of denial to maintain it. I mean, speaking for myself here, um, when I believed in an afterlife, I always had this nagging feeling in the back of my mind that my beliefs weren't really based on anything substantial. I mean, that they weren't really beliefs, that they were just wishful thinking, really. Um, now, compared to my current conclusions, you know, the conclusion that when we die, we're gone and our consciousness will almost certainly just disappear. I mean, I suppose that my beliefs in an afterlife were more comforting, or they would have been more comforting if it hadn't been for this constant, uneasy suspicion that they were crap. You know, and that's my point. My current ways of coping with death, they offer a major source of comfort that my old beliefs could not ever give me, and that is a strong degree of confidence that I'm not deluding myself. You know, having no cognitive dissonance in my philosophy about death, that is a profound source of comfort. Now, I'm not going to try to pretend that death doesn't suck. Death sucks, and death should suck. You know, life is precious, and we should treasure it, and we should mourn its loss. You know, if we care about the people we love, of course we're going to grieve when they die. It's reasonable and right that we should do that. If we treasure our own selves and our own lives, of course we're going to be upset at the thought that eventually we're going to die. It's reasonable and right that we should feel that way. But we can find ways to frame reality, you know, including the reality of death, that make it easier to deal with. You know, we can find ways to frame a reality that don't ignore or deny that reality and that still give us comfort and solace and meaning and hope. And we can offer these views to other people, people who are considering atheism but have been taught that it's just frightening and empty and hopeless. And we can offer it to other atheists who are maybe new to atheism and, and, and are still struggling with it. You know, the journey out of religion, it can be frightening and traumatic, even under the best of circumstances. And the fear of the permanence of death, that's often one of the most frightening parts of that transition. Um, I think that we can help ease that transition for each other. You know, the, the world is increasingly full of people who are falling out of religion or are close to falling out of it. And I think that we can help create a safety net that helps make that landing softer. So how do we do that? What is the safety net? What are some atheist philosophies of death? What are some ways that we can view death 
without belief in God or an afterlife, and that still offer comfort, meaning, solace, and peace. Now, I don't think there's just one. You know, there's not one magic bullet that's gonna make death lose its sting. Um, if for no other reason, there's lots of different facets of death that make it painful or frightening to, for different people, and different people wrestle with different aspects of death. Um, and there's some secular views of death that are gonna be very comforting to some people. And other people are just gonna be left cold by them, and still other people may even find those ideas actively upsetting. Um, so we're not just gonna, I'm not gonna try to find a magic bullet. Uh, we're gonna be talking about a lot of different ideas of how we can view death. So I wanna start with some of the more common ones. Uh, one of the oldest, one of the ones that dates back to Epicurus, if not further, um, is the understanding that being dead will be very much like not having been born yet. And being born yet, that wasn't anything to be frightened of or upset by. Um, the experience of being dead is not going to be painful or bad. It will just not be. Um, Mark Twain put this very succinctly. He said, Ooh, um, I do not fear death. I had been dead for billions and billions of years before I was born and had not suffered the slightest inconvenience from it. <laughs> now, for me, this is a perfect example of an atheist philosophy of death that many people find very deeply comforting and other people are totally baffled by. I mean, I for one, I don't actually get a lot of comfort from this idea. Um, it's not comforting to me because it's not addressing a fear that I have. I'm not afraid of being dead, but I still don't want to die. I, I, I'm alive now and I value that life. You know, I don't like thinking of my life ending. I, I don't like thinking about all the stuff that I'm gonna miss out on, you know, all the stories that I'm not gonna see the endings to. Um, I don't like thinking about saying goodbye forever to the people that I love. You know, and I'm, I'm egoistic enough to, to think of my life as special and valuable. I like thinking of myself as a special snowflake, and I don't like thinking of my special snowflake life just melting and being gone forever. Um, I am totally with Roy Batty and Blade Runner on this one. You know, all those moments, all those moments will be lost in time like tears in rain. You know, that does make me sad. And, and the fact that the state of death itself is gonna be painless, it doesn't really touch on that sadness for me. But that's just me. You know, again, I'm not trying to present a magic bullet, a single atheist philosophy of death that's going to make every atheist everywhere just be, oh, okay, death, that's, that's cool, I'm fine with that. Um, for many people, uh, the fears that they have about death do come from this fear of, of contemplating the void, contemplating non-existence, and just finding it unimaginable and terrifying. And for many of these people, thinking of being dead as essentially being the same as just not yet having been born, they do find that very comforting. Um, and that lets them live their lives with some degree of joy and contemplate their, lot, their death with some degree of acceptance. So let's move on. Um, another common atheist and humanist philosophy of death has to do with a sort of immortality by proxy. Um, yes, we're going to die, uh, but traces of us will live on. Um, in our children, if we have them, uh, in our work, in our art, uh, people's memories of us, you know, the ways that we change the world, and so on. You know, there's a sense that, okay, you know, we, you know, we're the little pebble dropped into the stone, into the water, and the pebble sinks to the bottom, but the ripples keep rippling out. Um, and, and this view of death definitely works better for me. Um, I mean, certainly the, the, the core of the meaning of my life does have to do with participating in life as fully as I can and, and making the world a better place because I was here. You know, and again, that, that, that egoism I was talking about, the desire to be a special snowflake, I mean, that's kind of soothed by the idea of making a mark on the world. You know, I'm gonna be gone, but I'm gonna have made my little mark and the world is different because I was here. Um, but for me, at least, it, it's a useful philosophy, but there's limits to that usefulness. Um, and those limits are the limits of human memory and the limits of human history and also just the limits of the lifespan of the planet and of the universe. I mean, yes, people are gonna remember me after I'm dead. 
but then they're going to die, and then those memories will be gone. Um, and even if my wildest, most egoistic, special snowflake imaginings uh, come true and some part of my work is remembered and recorded in history, I mean, eventually human history is going to stop. I mean, if nothing else, uh, the sun is going to go red giant in a few billion years, and the earth is going to be boiled away into lava. Um, and even supposing that humanity somehow survives that, we somehow survive the sun going red giant, um, the universe itself has an expiration date. The universe itself is going to keep expanding and expanding until it basically dissipates into essentially nothingness. I know, bummer. I really hate this. Um, I, I actually get more upset by the ultimate heat death of the universe than I do about my own death. You know, I'm like, you know, it's fine if I die, but everything, that's, that's, I can't deal with that. Um, so, are there any atheist philosophies of death that still offer some kind of comfort and meaning even in the face, not just of our own death, but in the face of the eventual boiling away of all existence? I think that there are. But it has less to do with this sort of immortality by proxy and more to do with life being valuable and meaningful even though it's transient. And even life being valuable and meaningful because it's transient. Um, so let's talk about some of those. Um, there's a particular philosophy of death that I personally keep finding myself coming back to again and again when I'm struggling with death. Um, and it's the understanding of just how astronomically lucky I am to be alive at all. Um, and I first encountered this idea in Richard Dawkins' book, Unweaving the Rainbow, and boy, I have serious problems with Richard Dawkins right now, and I'm sometimes reluctant to quote him. Um, but he said this really, really well, and so I'm going to to suck it up and I'm going to quote him anyway and credit where credit is due. He said this really well, even though he's a jerk. <laughs> um, so, so here's what he said. He said, we are going to die and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they are never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Arabia. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively exceeds the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I in our ordinariness that are here. And this idea helps me. When I look at life that way, Complaining about mortality kind of makes me feel like a jackass. I mean, it's like, it makes me feel that being alive and still complaining about mortality is like winning a million dollars in the lottery and complaining that it wasn't a hundred trillion. Um, you know, it, it reminds me how wildly improbable my life is, and that reminds me how precious my life is. And, and it helps remind me to, to just treasure that life and just savor it as richly as I can and to not get bogged down in despair because I don't get to keep that life forever. Now again, this approach may not work for everybody. You know, not everybody is going to be comforted by an atheist philosophy of death that makes them feel like a jackass for complaining about it. Um, so let's move on. Uh, let's move on to an area that I personally also find fascinating and very intensely fruitful and that a lot of other atheists I've talked to do as well. And that's the question of whether immortality is something that we would even want. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I don't want to spend too much time looking at whether heaven or other religious ideas of immortality would actually be all that blissful and awesome. Um, again, I mostly want to focus on positive atheist philosophies of death and not the critiques of religious ones. But this is an idea that many atheists find very comforting, and that's especially true uh, for atheists who once had very intense religious beliefs. Uh, so I do want to at least touch on it. And here's the thing. Most religious views of an eternal afterlife, they're only comforting if you don't think about them very carefully. They, they don't really stand up to scrutiny. Um, once you start really contemplating them, they either seem just tedious to the point of being hellish, 
or they involve such a radical change in your personality that it, it doesn't really count as an afterlife because you would be so radically changed, you really wouldn't be who you are. You would be gone. Um, and the Christian views of heaven are a really perfect example of this. They're not the only example, but they're a really good example. I mean, human nature being what it is, an unchanging, conflict-free eternity of praising God would be so monotonous that a few minutes of hell would be a relief. <laughs> you know? and, and also, human nature being what it is, an eternity with our family and friends could not possibly be perfectly blissful. You know, it would involve at least some conflict and disagreement and just irritation. I mean, I don't know about you, I love my family, but I don't want to spend an eternity with them. You know, a week is pushing it. Um, and and if, if our natures and personalities changed so much in heaven that this was no longer true, if they just, if it's like, well, that's just not going to be true because you're just going to be different and just because you're just going to be different, I would have to change so much, and I think we would all have to change so much for that to not be true, that we would essentially not be who we are anymore. And, it, and it, what would be the point? It's not really an afterlife if we're so different. Um, and, and similarly, if our loved ones didn't get to go to heaven, even though we did, we would either have to grieve for their absence, or we'd be so radically changed that we just didn't care about them or even remember them. Um, and, and this idea, this just truly monstrous idea about being so blissed out by God's presence in heaven that we don't even notice our loved ones burning in hell or don't care about it, and the idea that this would somehow be a good thing, um, this is actually a view of heaven that I've seen advocated by serious Christian ministers and, and leaders, including William Lane Craig. So, even apart from this question of whether a supernatural afterlife would be desirable, um, which I think it really wouldn't be, but even apart from that, I think that there's another way to look at the question of whether immortality is something that really, really we would want. And that's the idea of death as a deadline. Uh, so on, when I turned 40, I went through this very classic midlife crisis. I promise, by the way, this is not a tangent. I'm going to bring it back. Um, um, so I had this midlife crisis when I turned 40, and it didn't take the form of buying a sports car or having affairs with much younger women. Um, instead, I quit this high-ranking position in a lucrative career uh, that demanded a huge amount of my time and energy. Um, and I took a lower paying job that was less stressful, fewer hours, and more flexible hours so that I could concentrate on my writing. Now, what does this have to do with death? Well, here's what has to do with death. What happened here was that I turned 40 and I realized that I didn't have an infinite amount of time to get my writing career off the ground. And I realized that I didn't want to be on my deathbed at 70 or 80 or 90 wondering if I could have had a serious writing career and, and regretting that I nearly never really tried to make it happen. So, so I made it a priority. And I never would have done that. I never would have made my writing a priority like that if I hadn't started to get panicked about how little time I had left to do it in. In other words, I never would have done it. I would not have a writing career today without death. I, I would love to think that I'm the kind of person who would spend immortality doing marvelous things. I've got hundreds of years. I can, I can like study to be a, a, a linguist, and then I can finish that career, and I can study to be a botanist, and then I'm going to travel the world, and then I'm going to spend like decades working in soup kitchens, and I'm going to read all of Charles Dickens, and I'm going to do these wonderful things. I know myself better than that. I would spend immortality sitting on the sofa, eating chocolate chips, and watching Project Runway. Because... <laughs> I'm immortal. I've got all the time in the world. I can do all that wonderful stuff later. I can do the, the soup kitchens and the world travel and the learning the languages. I can do that next year. I can do that next decade. I am a very deadline-driven person, and death is a deadline. De death is the deadline. The word deadline has the word dead right there in it. Yeah. I mean, like I said earlier, I don't fear death per se. I don't fear the state of being dead. But I do fear, and it's probably my greatest fear about death, is I fear dying with regrets. 
Um, I, I fear dying and feeling like I didn't do everything that I possibly could with this wildly improbable life that I have. Death is what is motivating me to make something out of my life. And, and there's a flip side to that as well. I mean, death is what's motivating me to make something out of my life. But death is also what's driving me to really savor my life and to really experience my life as richly as I can. You know, death is, is what reminds me to stop and smell the roses. Like, like literally, ask my wife Ingrid, she will tell you when we're out walking, I stop to smell flowers, you know, I stop to, you know, to look at interesting buildings and interesting fashion and to chat with the people at the donut shop and to take pictures of street art. You know, death is what reminds me to not just always walk around with my head in a bubble. You know, death is what reminds me to, to, to not just always be living in my head and with, you know, my fears and anxieties and regrets. You know, when I look at both the astronomical unlikelihood of my life, and then when I look at the fact that that life's going to end someday, it doesn't just motivate me to make a mark on the world, it motivates me to let the world in. And the more I look at it, the more I see death as very much central to life. Now that's true for some very literal biological reasons. Um, uh, this is something that uh, P.Z. Myers has written about, um, and I don't fully understand all the details of the biological science, uh, but the bottom line is that dying is quite literally a necessary and inevitable consequence of being alive and being a multicellular living being. Um, the biological processes that make life possible are also what make death inevitable. You know, if, if you want to not die and you want the people that you care about to not die, really the only option is for us to not ever have been born in the first place. And I think death is, is central to life for, for more philosophical reasons as well. I mean, look at time. Look at time and the fact that we live in it. Um, our existence and our experience are dependent on the passing of time. Time and change are integral to who we are. I cannot imagine what it would even mean to be conscious, to have consciousness without change, without passing through time and being conscious of that passage of time. And inherent in change is loss. You know, the passing of time has loss and death woven into it. You know, each new moment kills the moment before it, and its own death is implied in the moment that comes after it. There is no way to exist in the world of change without accepting loss. I mean, if only the loss of a moment in time, you know, the, the way the sky looks right now, the, the motion of the air, uh, the number of the birds in the tree outside your window, the, the, the placement of your body, the temperature, the position of the people in the street, it is inherent in the nature of having moments. You never get to have this one again. And that's a good thing. Because all the things that give our life joy and meaning, you know, music, conversation, eating, dancing, playing with children, reading, thinking, making the world better, making love, all of it, all of these are based on time passing and on change and on the loss of this infinitude of moments that pass through us and then pass behind us. You know, without loss and death, we don't get to have existence. We don't get to have Shakespeare or sex or five spice chicken without allowing their existence and our experience of them come into being and then pass on. You know, we don't get to listen to Louis Armstrong without letting the E flat disappear and turn into a G. We don't get to watch Groundhog Day without letting each frame of it pass in front of us for a 24th of a second and then move on. We don't get to walk in the forest without passing by each tree and then letting it fall behind us. We don't even get to stand in the forest for hours and gaze at one tree without, you know, without seeing the wind blow off a leaf, without seeing a bird break off a twig for its nest, without seeing the clouds moving behind it, without seeing each manifestation of the tree dying and a new one taking its place. 
and I don't think we would want to have it if we could. I mean, the alternative would be time frozen, it would be a single frame of the film with nothing to precede it and nothing to come after it. And I don't think any of us would want that. I mean, that would essentially be death. That would be, that would really be death. And I don't think we want that. And if we don't want that, if instead we want the world of change, we want the world of music and talking and sex and all of it, then it's worth our while to accept and even to value the loss and the death that make that possible. I think it's a mistake to think that longevity is the truest measure of importance or value. You know, a five minute dance in the park can be more valuable than an ugly abandoned building that never gets torn down and stays up for years. You know, a half second of transcendent joy and connection with a lover can be far more important than a boring job that you slog through for 30 years. Fleeting moments are every bit as valuable as stone monuments. And in fact, fleeting moments are really all that we have. We should make the best of them. And that brings me to another atheist and humanist philosophy of death. As atheists, it's possible to see death as part of nature, as an inevitable consequence of being alive. And therefore, we can see death as something that intimately connects us with the universe. Uh, so I'm going to get a little personal here. Uh, my mother died of cancer when she was 45, uh, when I was 17. Uh, it was two months after I started college. Um, it, it's not something I talk about in detail very much. It was really awful. It was really traumatic. Um, it was really, really lousy timing. I mean, mostly for her, you know, but also for me to some extent. And it was horribly, horribly unfair. Except that it wasn't unfair. It was not any more unfair than a star going nova is unfair. It was not any more unfair than a cliff falling into the sea. When you don't believe that all death happens by design, when you don't believe in this grand cosmic design of the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God who theoretically loves you even though he's doing horrible shit to you, then you don't have to torture yourself wondering what you did wrong. You don't have to twist yourself into contortions trying to figure out why you're being punished or, or what lesson you're supposed to learn. When people die, when people die young, when people die in terrible pain, when people die freakishly for no apparent reason, you're going to have pain and you're going to have grief, but you don't have to pile on to that pain and grief any extra guilt about being punished or any extra guilt because you're trying to see a reason for it and you can't. And instead, we can see death as part of the way the world works. We are an animal species in the physical world. And animal species in the physical world get sick and die. We get into accidents. We get birth defects. We die in natural disasters. Sometimes it happens to good people. Sometimes it happens to young. And if it happens to someone you love, it's not because they did something wrong and it's not because you did something wrong. You can accept it and grieve over it and move forward. And when it comes to contemplating our own death, we can see it in much the same way. You know, death is the thing that ultimately separates us from the universe, and yet, paradoxically, it connects us with the universe as well. Death sucks, and premature death sucks worse. But it's part of the package deal of getting to be alive. You know, it happens because you and I and all the people around us are part of the world. We are part of the physical, natural world with all of its wonders and all of its horrors. And it is a world that doesn't particularly care whether we live or die. It, it's a world that doesn't care whether we're happy or unhappy, whether we suffer or rejoice. And there are some people who see that as bleak or cold. But it's a, it's a world of which we are a part. It is a world that we are intimately connected with down to our very molecules. It's not a world that stands apart from us and punishes us for reasons that we can never fathom. And without a God, we don't have to figure out what purpose our death is serving. 
we don't have to torture ourselves trying to figure it out the deepest motivations and the obscure reasoning of the physical universe. The physical universe doesn't have any. It does not have any motivation. Um, and so we can accept its inevitability and get on with our life. And finally, okay, finally, this is a very large topic. We could talk about this for hours. We could talk about this for years, and I hope that we do. Um, finally, for today, um, there's one more uh, atheist and humanist approach to death that I personally would take tremendous comfort in and find great consolation in. And that's the idea that it is okay to feel bad about death. I mean, there's a lot of religious believers who have a lot of guilt about the fact that they fear death. You know, they feel like, you know, if they really believe that death isn't the end, if they really believe that they're going to see everybody they love again in a few years, then why are they crying so hard at grandma's funeral? You know, it, it seems to bring up this terrible cognitive dissonance for them, and that can make death harder to deal with. Um, and in fact, there's some research uh, recently that backs this up. Uh, there was a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2009. Um, it shows that among terminally ill cancer patients, those with strong religious beliefs uh, who relied heavily on religion uh, to cope with their illness were more likely to get aggressive medical care in the last week of their lives. In other words, people who are most strongly attached to a belief in an afterlife, they're more likely to try to delay death when it's staring them in the face. Now this doesn't make any logical sense. But it makes perfect sense when you think of religion not as a genuine way, it's not really a coping mechanism, it's not actually a way of coping with death. It's a way of putting it on the back burner. It's not really a way of coping with death, it's a way of ignoring it. And that can create guilt, it can create conflict, and exacerbated fear when they really have to deal with death because it's staring them in the face. As atheists and humanists, we don't have to do that. You know, in an atheist, humanist philosophy, we can see death as natural, as a part of reality that we should face and accept. But we can also see grief as natural. You know, we evolved as a social species. We evolved to form deep emotional attachments with each other. And grief, when those attachments are severed, are a natural part of that. And, and we can also see the fear of our own death, our desire to not die, as natural. You know, if our species didn't have a strong preference for living over dying, we would not have lasted very long. Evolutionary forces very strongly favor animals who want to live and don't want to die. Um, you know, as atheists, we can see grief and we can see the fear of death as hardwired into us by billions of years of evolution. We can see grief and the fear of death as every bit as natural as hunger, every bit as natural as sexual desire, and every bit as inevitable. So I had this very good therapist once. Um, again, I promise this isn't a tangent. This is really as relevant. Um, and we did a certain amount of the usual therapy stuff. You know, we chattered ad nauseum to try to help me get insight into my behavior and make more conscious and better choices, blah, blah, blah. Um, but a lot of what we did was to simply make a safe place for me to experience emotions that I was afraid of. A lot of what we did was just, okay, what we're going to do for this hour is you're going to sit here and you're going to experience your emotions. Um, you know, these were emotions that I kept shoving to the back burner because they just felt so enormous. They felt like they were going to overwhelm me and drown me. And grief and the fear of death were very high on that list. And what I found was that sometimes, not even just sometimes, often, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, the best way to deal with difficult and painful emotions is to stop trying to fix them and to just let myself feel them, to just let myself have them. And when I let myself actually feel my emotions, they tend to pass. You know, sometimes they come back, of course, but then they pass again. And they're not compounded by this meta-fear, this fear of the emotion, adding to whatever unpleasantness of the emotion is, is, is itself. Now, I will caution, 
uh, that this only works is like really let yourself experience your most painful and difficult emotions. Um, this really only works if you have a pretty solid foundation to begin with. And that's where, at least for me, all this wonderful atheist and humanist philosophy of death comes in. You know, this idea that we didn't exist for billions of years before we were born, and we were born, and that wasn't painful and bad, and death will essentially be the same. You know, the idea that our genes or our ideas will, will live on after we die. Um, the idea that we were each astronomically lucky to have been born at all. Um, the idea that death is a deadline, that it acts to focus our lives and, and help us treasure our, our experiences. You know, the idea that loss, including death, is necessary for life and change to happen. Um, the idea that things don't have to be permanent to be meaningful. Um, the idea that death is a natural physical process that connects us with, the nat with nature and the universe. And, and more that I don't have time to get into today. None of this gives us an escape from fear or grief about death. There's nothing that gives us that. What it gives us is a solid place to come back to when the fear and the grief have passed. You know, it gives us a life preserver to hang on to. It gives us a bridge over the chasm. You know, it gives us the strength to actually feel our fear and our grief because we can trust that we have a safe place to return to when those feelings pass. And I think that for all the comforting philosophies that we can offer about death, Really, the most powerful thing we can give each other in the face of death is companionship and witness. You know, people sometimes ask, because I write a lot about death, as an atheist, what do I say to somebody who's grieving? What do I say to believers who are grieving? I'm not going to say they're in the arms of Jesus, because I don't believe that, but what can I say? What can I say to other atheists who are grieving? You know, there's no one-size-fits-all answer to that. It depends on you and them and your relationship and so on. Um, but some of the most powerful things that we can say when somebody is, is grieving are the simplest. I'm so sorry, this sucks, what can I do to help? If you're ever wondering what to say to somebody who's grieving, those are the three magic words. I am so sorry, this is really awful, how can I help? Also, if you're gonna, uh, the thing about help is, if you're asking it what, how you can help, offer something practical, because sometimes people who are grieving, they can't even think about what you could do to help. So, you know, what can I do to help? Here's what I can do. Um, and actually, I want to take a moment here to mention uh, Grief Beyond Belief, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, it's an online support group for grieving non-believers. Um, they have a website with forums and resources. They have a Facebook page uh, for discussion. And this kind of support, it can make a huge difference. Just support and companionship and just people saying, I am so sorry, that's so awful. Um, and when I'm struggling with the fear of my own death or when I'm struggling with grief over the death of somebody I loved, um, what comforts me most is not these ideas or philosophies, those do help, but what comforts me most is the presence of somebody who loves me, just sitting with me, just letting me feel what I have to feel, you know, not trying to fix it, not trying to make it go away, but just being with me while I feel it. You know, that, that presence of somebody who loves me, letting me know that I'm not alone, that, that makes it part of the foundation that I can come back to when the feelings pass. That makes me feel like right now the world is in chaos, but there's something solid to come back to when this is over. Um, I think American culture has this really pathological fear of painful emotions, and we have this kind of freakish sense that if you're ever sad about anything, you're a failure. Um, and I know that people often feel really helpless in the face of other people's grief. Um, we want desperately to fix it. We always want to find the magic button that's going to make it go away. Um, I've felt that way. I've sat with grieving friends and just got, oh, God, if I just said the right thing, I could make it okay. Um, but I also know that there is no magic button, that sometimes in the face of really intense grief, trying to fix it actually feels dismissive. It feels like you're trying to make it go away, that you don't want to be there with it. And sometimes the only way out of fear and grief is to just go through it. And sometimes the best thing we can do for people who are experiencing it is to just be with them. So here's the final thing I want to say to any non-believer who is struggling with death. I have these struggles too. 
I sometimes have this despairing feeling that death eradicates and trivializes my life. You know, the sense that without immortality that life is meaningless. Um, I sometimes also have the apparently opposite feeling, but I think it's actually related. Um, this despairing feeling that life is a burden, it, that it's this parade of petty struggles and mundane samenesses that just ends in nothingness in the void. But I don't feel that way most of the time. Most of the time, I love life passionately. And most of the time, I accept the inevitability of death with some degree of peace. And the fact that despair creeps in from time to time it doesn't make me a failure. It doesn't make me a failure as an atheist, and it doesn't make me a failure as a human. It just makes us human. So, thank you. All right, thank you very much to Greg and Christina for an amazing presentation. Um, so we do have time for, for a QA. and a um, We just ask, please, that uh, you keep your questions concise. Please uh, can be considerate of everyone's time. We are uh, a little bit limited on time. So please keep your questions concise to the point, and uh, please uh, actually make them questions. So um, <laughs> um, also, by the way, so for those, if, if anybody has a question and is not uh, perhaps comfortable with uh, say, you know, asking in front of such a large group, what you can also do is you can comment on the Meetup. So if you have the Meetup app or if you go to the Meetup website on your phone, you can just type it in. I'll monitor those. So as soon as those show up, uh, we will also include those in the Q&A. So uh, here we go. Um, who's got the first question? Uh, okay. Um, in your uh, ebook, do you touch on the topic of transhumanism, pro and con, or? Uh, so the question is in my ebook. Um, by the way, it's available in ebook and audiobook. Prints coming in the fall. Uh, the question is, do I touch on the subject of transhumanism, uh, which is sort of this this idea that um, people will somehow, someday, maybe even soon, uh, be able to download ourselves and our consciousness into computers and therefore live forever. And that's a, that's a the, you know, simplification, but for lack of, you know, that's a simplification, but it's, you know, since I don't have a lot of time. I don't talk about it a lot. Uh, and, no, I don't actually talk about it at all. Uh, mostly because it's a rabbit hole, um, and it's not, it's kind of off topic. I'm trying to, you know, this book is about, it sort of starts with the assumption that death is real and that death really is permanent and final, and, and how do we cope with that. Um, my, my short answer to transhumanism is that I do think it's, it's unrealistic. I think it's a denial of death. Um, I, I think that, is it possible that we might be able to download our consciousness into machines? Hypothetically, it's possible, you know, con you know, consciousness is a physical process. It's possible we might be able to transfer that. I also think it's possible that consciousness, that there's something about consciousness that requires it to be biological. Um, and I also think that even if we can transfer it into computers, that doesn't make us mortal. Anybody who's ever had their hard drive crash um, knows that, um, uh, that, that that doesn't, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of problems with transhumanism, and some of which is, is it even plausible? Some of which are just existential questions of would that still be us, or would having a uh, electronic substrate for our consciousness instead of a biological one changes so radically that again we wouldn't be who we are. Um, and then also again, ultimate heat death of the universe, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, it's like being a computer isn't going to help that. So I don't really talk about it, but so I don't really touch on it in the book pretty much for that reason. I just kind of started with the assumption that, that death is real and that it's final. Um, other questions? I can't, I can't necessarily see hands, so yes. Um, I don't think that you would think that life is meaningless if you do things to make a better world, you're proud of your life, you love your family, what do you think about that? Uh, so the question is, would you see life as meaningless if you do things that make the world better, or if you love your life, if you love your family? And that's, that is very much what it comes down to for me, and I think for a lot of us, is that, that, that um, you know, that life is meaningful because we're part of it. Um, I'm not gonna pretend that that's always easy, 
you know, certainly there's always this little part of me that's like, but then it's going to be over, and ultimate heat death of the universe, and the earth boiled into lava, and everybody I love is going to be gone too, so what's the point? Um, I struggle with that. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who struggle with that. And you know what, there's some people who don't. Again, there's some people, my wife, she, that's not an issue for her at all. Sort of the, the, the she has other issues with death and, and mortality, but sort of this whole, what does it all mean thing, you know, she, she, she is entirely comfortable with, you know, the meaning of my life is to participate in and to make things better for other people. Um, so yes, that, that is what it comes down to, is that, that um, this life is valuable, this life is precious, it's, it's rare, um, it, it's, impro it's improbable, um, and so we should make the most of it. Um, but it is, but I will, I will acknowledge that sometimes it's a struggle for me, and it's a struggle for other people as well. Um, other questions? You may have to like really get your hand in the air, because it's hard for me to see it back. Yes? You were pointing to somebody, and I don't see who you're pointing to, so who had your hand up? Yes, and there, there we go. Um, uh, atheist and LBGT, uh, I remember reading uh, something you wrote about how the atheist movement and humanist movements uh, really put themselves out there, like LBGT community, from out of the closet, uh, more than people know that you are out there and that you're the neighbors or friends or brothers and sisters. How is that, is that movement progressing? Do you feel like people are coming out more as humanists and atheists? Uh, so the question has to do with coming out, which, you know, segues into one of my other books, Coming Out Atheist, How to Do It and How to Help Each Other and Why. Thank you for helping me plug that. Um, um, and I, I do think that there's a lot of parallels between the atheist movement and the LGBT movement. I'm, I'm both, I'm bisexual and I'm atheist, and, you know, I see a lot of parallels between these communities and movements. And certainly one of those parallels is the importance of coming out and how, you know, coming out was a, a world changer for the LGBT community, you know, there's no way that we would be where we are in the LGBT community um, if it hadn't been for coming out. There's a lot of research showing that people are more accepting of LGBT people if they just know one or if they know that they know one, if all their LGBT people are in their lives aren't closeted because they're afraid because they're being a homophobic jerk. Um, and the same is true for atheists. There's not as much hard research on it, but what there is backs it up. Um, that uh, people are less likely to be hostile to atheists if they know that they have atheists in their, in our lives. Um, and also coming out is how we find each other. Um, it's, it's how we forge ourselves into a movement and a community. It's how we create support for each other. So yes, I think coming out is hugely important. And I will tie that back into today's topic of death, which is that I do think that atheism, atheism is on a lot of people's minds these days. We've, really, we've gotten ourselves in a way that we weren't, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And a lot of what religious believers struggle with when they consider atheism is, you know, how do you, you know, the first thing is, how do you have morality if you're not, in, you know, if, you know. Um, but a lot of what people also struggle with is, is how do you deal with death? How do you, you know, is it, how can you cope with the idea of your life being short and finite instead of in forever? Um, and so I think that part of coming out is talking about how we cope with life. You know, how do we find meaning? How do we find joy? How do we find morality? And how do we cope with death? Because that's what's going to make people who are maybe questioning their religious beliefs but are afraid to question those beliefs, uh, that's going to make people feel more comfortable. Um, other questions? Uh, yes? So, if we did live forever and life has changed, uh, have we talked about how much that person, thousands of years ago, how much does that really be? The myth of continuity itself kind of breaks down after a few million years. Um, I don't talk about that in the book, but yes, I do think that that's one of the one of the issues with immortality is you know you know life has changed. I'm not the same person I was obviously when I was two or when I was five or when I was twenty. And, and there's some continuity of self, there's some continuity of identity in there, but there's got to be a point at which that breaks down. There's got to be a point at which if I keep changing and changing and changing and changing and changing, it's not me anymore. You know, it's, it's you know, like, you know, think about evolution. It's like, you know, there's sort of these, you know, all these gradual little changes, but eventually we're not trilobites anymore. We're something else. And, you know, you can argue about where, you know, where where is that line, um, but... Uh, but there is a point at which, you know, if we were to live forever and if we were to change, 
then eventually there's a point at which it's not us anymore. And if we don't change, then that's also not us because change is central to who we are. Um, any other questions? Yes. Why are you pissed off at Richard Dawkins? <laughs> <laughs> Why am I pissed off at Richard Dawkins? That is a large question. Um, the, the short answer is Google Richard Dawkins sexism and Richard Dawkins racism, um, and that will give you a pretty good answer. Um, you could also Google Richard Dawkins stubbornly entrenching himself in racism and sexism even when people very patiently try to walk him through it. I don't know if that particular Google search would be fruitful, but... Um, uh, that, that, that's kind of the summary, is, is Richard Dawkins has said some very said and done some very sexist things and some very racist things, uh, some things that are dismissive of uh, victims of sexual abuse, um, and, uh, and when people have tried to talk him out of it, um, he pretty much just entrenches himself, which is sad because Dawkins is very has in the past been a very ferocious advocate for the wonder of changing your mind and how great science is, and science is so much better than religion because we embrace changing our mind, admitting when we're wrong, and so it's been really, actually very sad. I mean, I can get snarky about him sometimes, but it's actually really sad because he was a big hero of mine. He was, he's the reason I'm an atheist. Um, and uh, it's been sad to, to see him getting that entrenched in really bad ideas. Um, uh, Yes? Yes? Um, do you think that uh, secular humanist communities like some Sunday assemblies, etc., should maybe try to take a more active role in maybe reaching out to the LGBT community, especially in light of some of the horrible headlines we've seen recently about people going and wanting to bury the loved one and the pastor denouncing them from the pulpit and throwing them out of the church and things like that? You know? Should we be there as an alternative and, and do more? Uh, so the question is, should atheist and humanist communities, um, you know, Sunday Assembly or any other communities, uh, be make ourselves more uh, more available and do more outreach to uh, LGBT people, especially because religion can be so hostile and horrible to LGBT people? Um, yes, um, I think that I would like to see us uh, be reach, doing more outreach and making doing more to make ourselves more welcoming and more inclusive of a much wider variety of people. Uh, I'd like to see us be do more to be more welcoming and inclusive of women, of African Americans, Latinos, people of Arab descent, uh, people of Asian descent, all uh, the many different varieties of people of color. Uh, I'd like to see us be more welcoming and inclusive of uh, poor people and blue collar people and working class people. Um, uh, yes, I think that that is that is possibly the central issue facing organized atheism right now, um, and I think we're doing a better job of it than we were doing a few years ago, but that's not saying very much. Um, but we're doing a better job of it now than we used to be, and I want us to keep doing it. Um, and a lot of it is because, you know, there's a lot of marginalized people who rely on religion as a social support, as a practical support, and yet who get really shit on by religion. Um, LGBT people are a very good example of that. And, um, you know, and I would like to see us be a real alternative. Um, you know, as opposed to just, well, you get to be part of us if you don't, as long as you're willing to go along with everything the way we already do things. So, yes. Um, other questions? Yes. Just curious about the Alabama Chrome. I'm sorry? Just curious about the Alabama Chrome. Oh, I've never heard it called Alabama Chrome. This is, uh, he's asking about my uh, bracelet. It is a map of the L system in Chicago, which is where I grew up. Oh, I thought it was duct tape. Nope, nope, it's not duct tape. It's, it's actually, it's, a, it's, it's metal and it's a, uh, I grew up in Chicago and this is a map of the L system. That's where the Alabama Chrome came from. Oh, I've never heard it called that before. That's funny. Um, do you live in Houston? I do not live in Houston. I live in San Francisco. Um, I'm, I'm here for, I'm going to the Texas Secular Conference tomorrow, uh, which come to if you can. It's in Austin. Uh, so so uh, Vic brought me out the day before. Uh, yes? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, can you speak up a little bit? I'm a little hard here. Sorry. I was saying, with everything that's going on with the Black Lives Matter protest around the nation, how 
so the question is, with all the stuff, uh, the, uh, all the protests are happening with the Black Lives Matter, uh, the Ferguson protests, and all the protests since then, uh, why are we not seeing more uh, about that from humanist and atheist communities? I wish I had a good answer for that. Um, you know, we're seeing some, you know, there's some people who are, you know, there's some individual humanists, certainly, who are, who are you know, doing work on that, and, and some organizations. Um, but I wish I had a better answer to the question of why we're not seeing more. I, I, I and other than just all the obvious answers, it's like right now, organized atheism and organized humanism tends to be pretty white dominated, and a lot of white people don't see this as their problem. Uh, are you know all the you know it's like I'm trying to think of how to do privilege one on one in 25 words or less, and I don't have to explain that to you, but I might have to explain it to everybody else. Um, you know, it's it's hard to accept the reality of privilege, and it's hard to accept the reality the reality of racism, of sexism, and so on. Because once you accept it, it's like the red pill in the matrix. Once you accept it, your life just fucking changes. You know, <laughs> once you accept it, you have to, you have, you're, it's like, oh, I have responsibility to do something about it. You know, I have the responsibility to change myself. You start seeing all the ways that you yourself are perpetuating racism, perpetuating sexism, perpetuating transphobia, perpetuating classism, and so on. And, it's really hard to, to accept just a little bit of it without sort of the whole, once you see a little bit of it, the whole house of cards collapses. And so I think that that's, I mean, I can tell you the excuses that I'm seeing. I mean, you're probably seeing the same damn excuses. The excuses are, it's mission drift. This doesn't have anything to do with us, you know. It's like, you know, that's not about atheism, that's about all this other stuff. Except, you know what, if your humanist group can do a blood drive, if your humanist group can do, you know, uh, you know, can do, a, you know, food banks. If your humanist group can do highway cleanups, then you can do Black Lives Matter support. You know, you can do uh, support for uh, anti-racism work. Uh, you can do, a, you know, abortion bolathon month. You know, you can, you know, be. It's definitely not off topic for humanists. You know, for, you know, humanist is about this life is all we have, so we need to make it better, and that's true for everybody. Um, and I don't think it's even off topic necessarily for for atheists because atheist groups, you know, we need to be working on making ourselves more welcoming, more inclusive to a wider variety of people, and showing that we give a flying fuck about the issues that matter most to these people. You know, it's like you know, some things that Kivu Hutchinson talks about is every time some atheist group is throwing a shit fit about Ten Commandments monuments on city halls, well, yeah, that matters. It's an issue. It makes atheists not, you know, feel not welcome. It's, a, you know, it's all this stuff. But, you know, when black people are being shot by cops every four days, it's a little hard to get that worked up about it. Um, sorry, this is a bit of a rant, and I could go on about it for a long time, but... Um, uh, yeah, the, why I wish I had a better answer than why other than just privilege is hard and it's really hard to let go of, it's really hard to accept because once you accept it, then you have to do something about it and that's hard. Right to die. That's a really good question. Um, the short answer is, we our bodies are right to decide. You know, the same reason that I support abortion rights, or the same reason I support right to die. Um, you know, the, the the whole idea that we don't have the right to decide when to end our lives, it's very rooted in religion. It's very rooted in the idea that we don't belong to ourselves, we belong to God, and God gets to decide. It's, you know, you can't play God, even though it's your own goddamn life. Um, I do think that, that it's important to be careful. Um, you know, there, there, there's some potential for abuse, you know, with, you know, euthanasia, you know, with uh, physician-assisted suicide. There's some potential for, you know, people being pressured into into doing it if, you know, they, they don't really want to do it. But there's also safeguards. You know, I know that there's, in Right to Die states and countries, there's a lot of safeguards in place. Um, and uh, there's actually, there's, uh, I think, atheist and humanist uh, organizations or there's right to die organizations that are run by atheists and humanists. They might be really good to get somebody in to speak about that. Um, and one of the things I saw a presentation by one at one point, and one of the things that she said is that in right to die states, 
there's sort of there's these systems you have to go through. There's these procedures you have to go to if you if, through if you want to have physician assisted suicide. And what happens is a lot of times people who are very ill they go through those steps so that they're ready to you know to take the take the last pill or whatever it is. And then they don't. Just knowing that they have the option, just knowing that they have that power, that they have the power to end their suffering when they're ready to, makes their dying more manageable. So, uh, yeah, I am a huge advocate for our, li you know, our lives are ours and our bodies are ours, and you know, we we have the right to end them. Uh, yes. So, in, in in that same vein, uh, the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Uh, the death penalty, I am a huge opponent of the death penalty. Um, for There's a lot of practical reasons why I'm against the death penalty. You know, some of it, is, it's, it's applied in a really racist way, and it's applied in a really classist way. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, people who get killed in death, uh, you know, by the death penalty tend overwhelmingly to be black or brown, and they tend overwhelmingly to be poor. There's all these issues about, you know, there's, you know, if somebody was wrongly convicted, if they're just in prison, you can make good on it. If they've been killed, you can't make good on it. But kind of what it comes down to is that life is precious. And even the life of somebody who's committed a terrible crime and is living their life out in pr prison, it's still precious. And I don't think the state should be in the business of, of killing people. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that's, I, th I think that killing people is an absolute last resort. It's something that you do when your life is, it, or somebody else's life is immediately on the line, and I don't think the state should be in the business of doing it. Let me challenge you here. Would you kill Hitler or Pol Pot? Uh, well, that's that's. You, no, then no, we no, start no. with yeah. Okay, we're starting to get into the hypotheticals there, and you know, would you kill? You know, would you kill Hitler? Would you kill Pol Pot? And that that's like that's again. It's like you know, absolute last resort. If somebody is threatening your life or threatening other people's lives, somebody who's in prison. Is they're in prison, and you know they're, you know, they're, you know, they're not Hitler, they're not Pol Pot, um, and and I think that there's, yeah, it's it's I mean it's a large question, it's a little bit off topic, but um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of again practical reasons, racist, classist, um, uh, you know, innocent people get executed, um, but ultimately I just don't think that that's something the state should be doing. Uh, there was a question back there. Did you have a question? Without blinking okay. an eye. Uh, it seems to me with all the things that are going on in the world, the war, like having to talk about people and all that, this, uh, this idea is sitting around focusing on my death, seems all in itself, seeing it's statistical. It's not really clear. Um, I mean, wait, hold on. Wait, wait. There we go. Um, so the, the, the question or the comment is, you know, this terrible thing is happening in the world, you know, isn't it a little bit self-absorbed to like be staring at our navels wondering about, you know, how about mortality? I, I don't, I think we, we have big lives and we have big minds and we can care about a lot of things. And, you know, one of the reasons that I do advocate for social justice and one of the reasons that I do want to try to make life better for people who's who are very, very marginalized and, and whose, whose lives are really lousy, is I want everybody to have the opportunity to navel gaze about mortality. You know, I, I want everybody to have the opportunity to have lives that are filled with joy, and a lot of joy is trivial things. You know, it's like a lot of what makes life meaningful. It's not necessarily sort of the big things. Sometimes it's the really small things. Uh, that, that, that make our lives matter. It's these sort of little moments of, of human connection. Um, and I also think I'm, when I'm uh, speaking at the Texas, Texas Secular Convention uh, tomorrow, my topic is activism burnout. And a, a sure fire path to burnout is never letting yourself have a break, never letting yourself have anything for yourself. And always, if you're always focused on, you know, if we want to try to make the world better, we have to take care of ourselves too. And you know we we have to replenish ourselves if we're going to contribute to the world, and we do that however we want. And if we do that by navel gazing about mortality, or we do that by eating chocolate chips and watching Project Runway, um, I, I think that's okay. I think we get to take care of ourselves. Um, 
Yes. If the people are worried about how their family's going to pay for their funeral, they can opt for cremation for about seven hundred dollars. We donate their body to a medical school like the Baylor College of Medicine, which is completely free. Yep. Okay. And then your body can have a useful purpose because the medical students use it for research. Yep. Um, Drifting, but um, from the topic, but yeah, it's it's you know the, the high cost of death in, in America is, is you know is a problem. High cost of funerals is a problem, and um, you know it's worth knowing that there are options. You know, there's you know there's cremation, there's donating body to science, donating body to medicine, and so on. So, um, and and I think that that's that's something that can also give us a, a sense of humanist meaning. You know, it's like you know I die, but you know you know my my organs are going to help somebody live. You know, um, after after I'm gone. Um, yes. Well, everything I've heard you say up to this point in time, I can't imagine that you would be in favor of this nightmare we call the drug war. It's, it's probably her blacks and minorities more than anyone. And it's a farce. It's absolutely disgusting. Uh, so the comment is about the drug war, and yeah, again, this is you know. Uh, I could rant about this for a very long time, uh, but yeah, drug war sucks. Um, hugely racist, hugely classist. Um, if you haven't read, uh, uh, what's it called, The New Jim Crow, is that the name of the book? Yeah, um, yeah. I'm sorry? Right. Um, say the name again. Michelle? Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, about how um, dr the drug war is essentially... Cre has created a permanent black and brown underclass in the country of people who just cannot, who literally cannot escape the cycle of poverty and the cycle of imprisonment. Um, also, drugs are another one of those my body or my right to decide things. I mean, there's some limits on that, like drug driving and so on, you know, and, you know, it's like, you know, drug abuse has an effect on people other than yourself, but ultimately, my body, my right to decide, and that includes abortion, and it includes birth control, and it includes euthanasia, and it also includes weed. Um, so, um, uh, we're probably running low on time, so maybe two more questions. Are there any, uh, Vic, are there any questions from online or no? Not yet? Okay. Uh, so let's just take maybe another couple questions. Uh, yes. That's a really good question. The question is, is anybody, uh, is there any talk about creating a bodily autonomy amendment to the Constitution? Not that I know of, but I think that's a really good idea. Um, I mean, obviously there's all these questions about where's, where's the limit and where does my bodily autonomy, you know, affect, you know, you know, impinge on other people. Um, uh, but yeah, I, and I, th I think the chances of this happening in the United States right now are very slim. Um, uh, but if we get a more progressive and more secular, perhaps, you know, if the atheist community can get its act together and actually turn itself into a political and lobbying force, um, then, then that's, I think that that's, you know, something that would, could, could cover a lot of these, a lot of this ground, sort of the idea that our bodies belong to us. And, you know, I, I think that's a, a potentially interesting idea. Um, any other questions? Yes. So on the topic of you going to Austin tomorrow, yes. uh, what conferences are, should we be looking forward to or conventions or anything in the upcoming time? Are you putting together a panel on what and who are you inviting? Okay, um, uh, let's see. So the Texas Secular Convention, there's going to be a panel uh, at the Texas Secular Convention this weekend in Austin. Uh, I'm going to be part of a panel on minorities and marginalized people. Um, I'm also, again, speaking about burnout. Um, other conferences, oh my gosh, I don't even know where to begin with that. Um, Skepticon. Uh, Skepticon is probably my favorite of, of I shouldn't pick and choose like this, but I'm going to anyway. I go to a lot of atheist conferences, and probably my favorite is Skepticon. Uh, Skepticon happens in, of all places, Springfield, Missouri, and it's free. It's one of the reasons that I like it. It is a 100% free conference. When you have to get yourself there, and you have to find a place to stay, um, but the conference is free, and, and that makes a big difference in terms of making it accessible to a, a much wider variety of people. Um, uh, and and it's also just fun. It's sort of both very, it's like really, really super brainy um, and also just really playful and fun and people have a rocking good time. So, uh, but there's lots of, you know, the atheist conference schedule has gotten to the point where I cannot possibly keep track of it. Um, and, you know, it's just, 
it, it's one of the things actually it, that is exciting is there used to be like this handful of national atheist conferences and now there's like just dozens of regional ones all over the country and all over the world so um, so I couldn't even begin you know there's American Atheist is coming up in April that's in Memphis and um, but yeah, if you can only go to one, go to uh, go to Texas Secular Convention. Um, but if you can only go to two, go to the Texas Secular Convention and go to Skepticon. Um, yes. Um, do you think the chaplain of the murders in North Carolina was a hate crime? Do I think the Chapel Hill murders in North Carolina is a hate crime? Boy, that's a very large question. The very short answer is I don't know. I think it's certainly very plausible that it was a hate crime. I think it's certainly not outside at all outside the realm of possibility that it was a hate crime. Um, I don't know enough about you know about it to be able to say yes, this was definitely. Are, are people familiar with this, by the way? Um, there was an atheist, very out atheist, uh, anti-religious named Craig Higgs in Chapel Hill uh, who murdered three Muslims. Um, uh, uh, his neighbors um, and. They were neighbors that he had had disputes with about parking and other things. He'd had disputes about parking and other things with a bunch of other people. At the same time, uh, he had a lot of very strong anti-religion stuff on his Facebook page, including stuff against Islam and including against extremist Muslims. Uh, one of the victims herself told her father that she thought that this hatred and anger against them was religiously motivated. And, you know, I hate to say it, but it's not as if anti-Islam and anti-Muslim bigotry in the atheist community is rare. It's not. It's way too common. Um, and there's a lot of our leaders who asked before, why do I not like Richard Dawkins? Richard Dawkins has done a lot to foster anti-Muslim bigotry in our community, as have some of our other, bigotry. you know, leaders. Um, so the short, I'm sorry? Reality, not bigotry. Um, I, that's why I still can't hear. There's a difference between reality and bigotry. There is a big dif difference between reality and bigotry, and we can criticize Islam. There is legitimate cri criticism of Islam. There's legitimate criticism of extremist Islam. And it's not like all criticism of Islam is bigoted, but a lot of it is. You know, there is criticism of Islam and, uh, and criticism of Muslims uh, that is really bigoted. And it, it shows up a lot in our community. And we need to push back against it. So the short answer is, I don't know. I don't know if there's enough evidence at this point to say for, for any degree of certainty whether this was a hate crime. Uh, but I certainly think that it's, it, it's likely, I think it's certainly plausible that it was. Um, and, and even if it wasn't, you know, yeah, pushing against anti-Islam bigotry in our community, where's the downside? You know, it's like, the, you know, it's like, oh no, we pushed back against anti-Islam bigotry in our community, and we didn't have to. You know, so what? There's anti-Islam bigotry in our community, and it's, and it's fucked up, and it hurts people. Um, we should hurt, we should oppose all dogs. All. Yes, and once again, I will say there's a difference between opposing dogma and being bigoted against the people. And certainly there's a big difference of good between opposing dogma and killing people because of their religious beliefs. And... No one should get killing. I'm sorry? I haven't said anything about killing people. Right. Uh, and what I'm saying is, yes, we can critique Islam just like we critique Christianity, just like we critique Judaism and Buddhism and Wicca and all the religions, and we can do that. But we need to be really careful, especially when we're critiquing religions and religious identities that are hated and that there is a lot of bigotry against. You know, there is a lot of anti-Muslim bigotry in this country. And, um, and, you know, and we do not need to be contributing to it. Um, uh, one more question? Well, after, I was there a I would imagine there would be a lot of bigotry to consider things like the Christian crusades against Christians. I'm sorry, say that again, I didn't understand. I would imagine you, you should expect a lot of bigotry against Christians when you look at the history of Christian crusades and the part of the I'm still not sure that, quite sure that I understand the question. I mean, is there bigotry against Christians? The thing is that Christians are the, in the United States, Christians are the dominant culture, they're the dominant religion. Um, is there sometimes, you know, atheists 
who say stupid bigoted things about Christians, yes. Um, I've seen, you know, atheists say things like, you know, you know, just call all religious believers in general and Christians in particular, you know, say things like they're stupid because of their beliefs, they're sheep because of their beliefs. Um, I just think they're nuts. Can you please not do that, actually? Um, I think they're not. Okay, there's, please don't do that for two reasons. First of all, it's not true. If you're defining anybody who believes in religion... Okay. As, okay. No, I, let me finish, sir. I'm, I'm the one with the microphone. You are indeed. Um, and people came here to hear me speak. Um, first of all, if you're saying that people are nuts for believing in religion, that's like 90% of the world. Yeah. And it's not a very useful definition of nuts. Also, it marginalizes people who are mentally ill, and that includes me. Um, I have a, I experience uh, suffer from clinical depression. Something like one out of three people in the, the country uh, suffer from some sort of mental illness. When we use words like nuts to insult people, that marginalizes people with mental illness. Please don't do it. So thank you all very much. It's been a really interesting conversation. I really appreciate you coming out here tonight. And I will be over there sending books. Hey, yeah, thank, thank you again to uh, Mrs. Greta Christina for an excellent, uh, thank, thank you very much for coming out to uh, speak to us and uh, for such an amazing presentation. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone here as well for coming out.